some questions at the end. So welcome everyone. And with that, I will turn myself off and hand it over to you, Andrea. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much for handing this over to me. It's a pleasure today to be here on really. Um, just a few questions on my side. Uh, this is going to be the first of three meetings, a series of three meetings. So we kickstart today, the first one in a series called The Road to Smart Markets. And this is very first episode uh, featuring as guest speakers, my dear friend Jonathan Garcia in California and Quincy Jones from Arizona right now is my colleague at STC Foundation. He's a software developer, an amazing one. So today, first episode, as I said, we're going to touch in this three episodes, several aspects connected to Society 6.0, regenerative finance, and many other topics related to that with a nice set on our main domain, which is, of course, supply chain and trade finance. Uh, would I hope that we're going to introduce you to a whole new world of microeconomies and innovations with a nice what set on topics such as ESG, social impact, and other stuff. Interesting one, of course. So glad to welcome to today Johnny and Quincy. Uh, I'll let you kick off the meeting with a presentation. Quincy, stage is yours now. Johnny, you back him up. So I'm really honored to have you speaking about DLT for business today. So stage is yours, guys. Well, I, I got to say, Andrea, thank you for having us on. I know that this has been a presentation that Quincy and I have been dreaming of for a long time. And personally, I got to introduce Quincy just really briefly as the guy that helped me really get the big picture. Right. Because when we have to talk about what we're about to enter here with the road to smart markets, it comes down to the big picture of the technology, not the small picture. And I really do hope that in this presentation, everybody can go ahead and get a better idea of what it is to be able to transition industries forward. And I think that Quincy's presentation today will do a great job to help illustrate new business models, new ideas, and we'll do our best to be able to some Keith can help you move your entire initiatives forward and Quincy obviously this is something we've both been looking forward to if you're ready to go the mic is yours yep yep I'm ready yeah uh, thanks for the intro Johnny um you guys can go on to the next slide great great uh, I'm actually uh really glad uh, Johnny pointed out that one of the biggest things I wanted to emphasize was sort of like what does what does uh, what does adoption look at scale for a lot of these technologies? Uh, I titled this automated economies, smart markets, and smart contracts and gaps that facilitate them. And it's more than just about what makes up a smart contract or what makes up a DAP or what makes up a token. Uh, it's really about how do all of these different components interact with each other at scale? How do tens of DAPs, hundreds of DAPs interact with each other? How do tens of hundreds of types of tokens interact with each other? And what type of economy does this look like now with this type of activity uh, persisting um, on these on these technologies? So one of the first things I wanted to, wanted to emphasize were when it comes to blockchain technology, there's a, there's a lot of different things that come into play. And one of the biggest things is automation. Um, we see this a lot when people talk about smart contracts and automating like business deals and automating agreements. Um, but also with this, you come uh, with the second part, which is sort of a shared accounting element. So you have these tools that are able to be automated, and then they can share different units of accounts uh, within their automations. Um, in that, uh, you have this cohesive means for applications to easily interact with each other, uh, smart contracts. Uh, and these smart contracts can make up different dApps, and these different dApps can all interact with each other, sort of how APIs would in a traditional uh, tech environment. Um, but due to the blockchain structure, uh, smart contracts can natively tag and uh, execute functions from other smart contracts. So with this, you end up getting a uh, you end up getting a economy of different dApps that are able to execute the functions of other dApps that are able to pass along uh, units of accounts in the form of tokens. And these tokens can be assets. These tokens can be 
um, points. These tokens can be any unit of account that can be shared between multiple applications. All of these different applications will always be exchanging information and exchanging um, exchanging a feed of executions amongst each other, creating this broader economy. Uh, if that sort of makes sense. Uh, Johnny, I didn't know if you wanted to elaborate there a little bit uh, or not. Well, subjects here. I think it's the next slide. Just a second, actually, if you, if I could, just because you hit on something about automation, and I think a lot of the uh, people that might be listening would like to understand a little bit more of the concept of how these um, protocols can actually help them facilitate the trade finance based upon the new legalities and regulations that are being enforced, whether it's UK law or it's you know the model law that's being kind of implemented on the United Nations side. I think that these are the reasons why these protocols will finally be able to come into play, considering that they really do solve the possession problem that I think a lot of these nations are experiencing in limiting trade finance. And so that's why I really want to highlight that when you're going through all of this, I hope people can listen with the ears of because of these previous laws that are being implemented, whether it's in the UK, English law, or we're looking at the other side of the world. We're really looking at how are these laws now finally able to give birth to the use of the technology. And that's what this entire presentation is going to allow for. So I'm really happy you hit on those items because it really does bring light to the possession problem and how digital assets can be able to facilitate all the supply chain logistics by being able to have assets that they can call upon the way that you're about to describe. So please continue. Thank you. So Actually, um, to a point that you... Uh to a point you had there. Um, one of the things that make these things, that make blockchain technology so efficient uh, is, and when I reference these applications being uh, uh, autonomous, um, these apps run on decentralized networks. And these apps are able to run in an environment where they don't need an individual to continuously host the application. Like in a traditional environment, you'd set up a server in a database. Um, and because of that, these applications can use this shared databasing and use this means of being able to operate uh, autonomously, because like I said, no one's necessarily hosting the environment, it's sort of hosted decentrally. Um, you could have these autonomous, decentrally hosted applications be able to interact with each other in a way where traditional applications would have to have two segregated uh, environments that would have to have both set of developers interact with each other to be able to allow access to each other's environments, where each individual application can run autonomously on a decentralized network um, and be able to pass information between each other on that network, um, allowing for a, a easier means and more efficient uh, means of transfer, especially when it comes to assets. Uh, and can you get to the next slide? So global shared accounting, it's a point that I've pointed out before, um, but it's a point that I don't think it's hammered in enough. Um, people always ask, why blockchain? Why would I build an app on blockchain? And uh, it's a pretty valid question, you know, uh, especially when I speak to a lot of developers that are very familiar with a lot of traditional technologies. Um, well, one of the greatest value proposition is global shared accounting. And sort of like I stated before in the earlier example, where if let's say you had two different uh, finance firms and they both had segregated databases and segregated applications, the means for them to be able to interact with each other would be quite difficult because they would have to build uh, external APIs for the other to be able to access the, their environment. And they'd have to do that exponentially for the amount of different, uh, for the amount of different participants they want to be able to interact with their environment, as well as them in that interact with other environments. Um, with global shared accounting that, that's able to operate on uh, these blockchain uh, networks, you have an easier means for uh, different applications to reference the assets and reference the units of account uh, within other applications. I sort of have this little like crude example here, uh, this little diagram where you have a few participants, you have a few smart contracts, and you have an oracle here. Uh, each participant can interact with any other participant in terms of being able to send assets. Each participant is able to interact with every smart contract, and every smart contract is able to interact with every smart contract, uh, sort of by virtue by operating on the blockchain. Where in a traditional system, each participant would be segregated 
into their own accounting system. And each application would also be segregated in, to its own accounting system. And the means for the applications to interact with each other as well as the participants to interact with each other would be pretty segregated. Um, and in here, I sort of have an oracle at the top in which the uh, smart contract should read from the oracle, you know, smart contracts should read from other smart contracts, uh, price feeds so those smart contracts can allow for additional functionality, as well as other smart contracts potentially interacting with each other for additional functionality. And with them able to have this global shared accounting mechanism, not only can they share accounting of different assets, but they can share uh, access to different applications and their functionalities, allowing for an easier, more cohesive uh, economy of different services that can be executed by a participant or by another smart contract. Um, Johnny, do you have anything to add or are there any questions? Yeah, and, and I, I- If not, we can go to the next, oh. We get the next slide. I do apologize. Actually, I have a, a question. The microphone to come on, but I think you're now or take them later. But uh, can you please offer a layperson's definition of the NFT, the non fungible token? Actually, I was that's my next slide. Actually, uh, before you get the, there, the next, you could see the next slide or the slide after that. I have a whole slide that goes over that goes entirely Just into that. Because I think one of the main points that I think I've learned in all the discussions that we've been having over the past few years about global shared accounting, it comes down, if I'm not mistaken, and maybe you could touch on this a little bit more, on how it helps to mitigate trade finance risk because you're able to understand a company's ability to meet those obligations as they are entering through these different layers of trade and finance. Can you go into that a little bit, please? Yeah, the big thing for being able to offset risk is the transparency. So just like you're able to see the interaction between all of these different applications and smart contracts and, and so on, you're able to have sort of like a live auditing ability and transparency that the activity is valid, that there isn't any fraudulent activity, that there isn't any uh, issuance of things that don't exist, or there's 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 an there's a uh, there's you can maintain that the system is accountable because of the transparency of the blockchain. So, regardless of any sort of activity you want to engage with, you have the transparency to see if that that activity is valid. And I think this goes into the um, uh, you can call it an index of a company's performance, right? Or multiple companies' performance. And that essentially is what allows us to be able to validate whether they would be able to participate in the market for the duration of certain obligations. And this is kind of what you're alluding to, if I'm not mistaken. Hopefully, uh, yeah, my internet didn't get cut out there. there. But it seems to be that that's one of the yeah. main... Okay. Well, what I was saying is, the ability to have transparency in trade finance and supply chain sectors, it basically means the integration of risk assessment um, across multiple different parties involved. And I think that that's really one of the things that we've been able to identify as a true use case value proposition for other potential you know, participants who are looking to adopt a the technology. They can transition in and be able to guarantee that. Your internet's breaking out a little bit, uh, Johnny. Holiday poof. Yeah, Johnny, you're breaking out a little. I think I think one thing to also emphasize okay. on Go ahead, Quincy. Um, is uh, uh, in traditional systems there would almost be a there'd be bottlenecks in terms of access to information. With blockchain technology, there really is no bottleneck. Everyone has access to the same information. Um, as opposed to, you know, one macro service that everyone uses having access to all that information or uh, one company that people just tend to have to tend to use to access different things or have access to that information. Now that you have this easy access for everyone that have access to the same information, um, you have sort of a better and more fair playing ground um, to be able to operate in. Yeah, so go to the next slide. So yeah, the next slide is about uh, uh, cross exchange, uh, Cross chain ex of value exchange, and then we'll get into NFTs and to all of that. And I actually, have a whole explanation for that too. But just to sum up, cross chain value exchange. Um, people talk about uh, blockchain and adopting blockchain, and then they talk about which one. 
And then there's sort of this idea of like, what does it mean for there to be, I think there's 26,000 blockchains. What does it mean to be able to choose one chain over the other? Um, all of them have a bunch of different technology, te uh, technical specs. All of them have a bunch of teams behind them. All of them have a bunch of holders behind them. Um, why hold, uh, why use any specific blockchain? Um, well, we start getting into cross-chain value exchange. So for the majority of blockchains that are going to persist out there, a means of interoperability between each other is almost uh, is almost required for them to be uh, to for them for any blockchain to reach its maximum uh, saturation in that in that regard. And what I mean by that is each blockchain is going to have a specific type of activity that it can facilitate. And people will go to those blockchains to facilitate that activity. But being able to have access to other blockchains from that chain, whether it's through bridges or other technology, you can maximize the total amount of uh, users for a particular type of application that facilitates some sort of activity. Or you can um, extend liquidity between chains, uh, allowing there to have access to value or access to capital you otherwise wouldn't have. And having easy access um, across chain to um, services and assets that can be uh, moved between chains uh, can only benefit um, essentially every chain involved. The biggest thing is each chain individually will facilitate a very specific type of activity. Um, usually the example I like to give is with XCC, we talk about uh, um, global trade finance and what does that mean and this could be automated derivative contracts this could be commodities this could be whatever some level of trade finance activity and let's say you may have a uh, forex activity like foreign exchange on uh, xrp and people are exchanging uh, foreign exchange currencies on xrp well if i wanted to tap into sort of forex liquidity being able to have access to xrp for that level for that level of uh, activity would be great. And if somebody on XRP wants to have access to derivatives, they're having access to the XCC, uh, XCC network via XRP would also allow them access to uh, service and access to liquidity they otherwise, wouldn't have, uh, they otherwise wouldn't be able to have access to. And that just expands the total amount of uh, engagement between all parties, between all chains. So the main gist of this slide is uh, it's not really about uh, what chain specifically, it's about what chain uh, would you go to to facilitate uh, a specific type of activity? And from that chain, what other services can you leverage from other chains? And I think if I could touch on interoperability a little bit, because I think that you're hitting on a really good point, but it could also be explained, uh, or, or I'm sorry, it could also be understood by others what you're saying with the term of interoperability. And I think what helped me really understand that was to take what the, the information you just provided about how these applications can communicate with each other to share value. It all really depends on, I guess, the three layers of how these protocols are built, the app layer, the settlement layer, and obviously the data layer. Is there anything that we can give the public a little bit more information on so that that way they can understand essentially what is the cross value chain uh, value exchange that we're making? Because sometimes it's happening at different layers. And I think that that's the power of these NFTs. Well, there, I guess in terms of the different layers, um, there would be, I guess, I guess there'd be three layers or three, three ways you could look at it. So there'd be the value exchange of the native, uh, of the native asset. So um, whatever the native currency of the network, there'd be sort of a value exchange uh, for that capital to be used on other networks. Then there's sort of the data exchange, what you stated, where you may have an NFT on one network be referenced on another network. And that's primarily just the information and the representation of that same token on another network. And then there's the execution of services across networks, like DAP A and DAP B being able to execute um, each other from two different networks. Um, and these all, uh, these different uh, means of allowing for uh, cross-chain value exchange or just cross-chain execution um, are just ways for 
applications to have access to more users and for applications to expand the total amount of uh, liquidity they would otherwise have access to. If you're, if you're only siloed to one network and this network has, let's say, a billion dollars worth of value, and there's another network with also another billion dollars worth of value, oh, uh, being goodness. siloed to those individual networks won't allow for the total amount of growth that each network would have if both networks were able to have access to each other. And now that now the, now both networks uh, in conjoint would have access to $2 billion worth of value, which means more services and more trade and more liquidity. And I think that that's one of the things that is, is really important for the continued evolution of business models on chain, which is one of the main things that this discussion focuses on as we lead towards the road to smart markets. It's how do we create smarter companies at the end of the day? You know, it comes down to how do we help these companies understand how the interoperability and the transfer of assets can happen. And I think this is something that people could look into. Obviously, today, it's a little bit more so on moving it forward towards smart commodities and smart markets. But it's obviously about bringing light to uh, what are the safest methods to be able to do this. And so the um, ability to be able to bring value across chains right now may be a little foreign to many. And that's where they're doubtful about the interoperability. But there is a process that we must follow that allows us to be able to do this. And so that's why I think the maybe a brief introduction to what NFTs can really help them understand what are we even moving and, and between these digital assets. So I'm really excited for this okay. next slide. I think it's, it's going to give a lot of clarity. So please. So I'll go continue. over public and private engagements real quick. This is important also because people talk about public networks and private networks and what are the benefits of each uh, of each network or whatever. And uh, why would you use either either one of these networks? So um, when dealing with uh, any public blockchain, uh, one of the main benefits of using a public blockchain is the means of being able to move capital between uh, different participants over the internet. Um, and this means of being able to move capital is incredibly convenient because you're able to do it uh, you're able to do it with anybody else who has access to the network. Anyone who's able to custody any amount of asset and have access and an internet connection, you have a means of being able to move capital with them. Uh, private networks, uh, one of the biggest requirements for private networks, especially when dealing with enterprises, is managing private data, whether it's private uh, user data, PII data, um, personal identifiable, uh, identifiable information, um, whether this is some sort of uh, whether this is some sort of uh, compliant data or some sort of data that needs to, any sort of data that, need, that needs to remain private in sort of private environment. A lot of the uh, private blockchains or private blockchain tools um, allow for that same management of data the same way you would deal with value. So you can still use uh, the same tools like your Solidity contracts and your different SDKs, but you're able to build them for a private environment uh, focused around uh, user data. Uh, and then you can also build tools in your public environment in terms of being able to move capital between uh, different participants. Uh, and in your private environment, you can add uh, participants in that private environment to give them access to that private data, whether this is business to business access, whether this is um, businesses sharing uh, user data, whatever it may be. Um, they would primarily use private networks to secure uh, data as opposed to move capital and public networks to move capital uh, between different participants over the internet. All right, next one. All right, here we are. NFTs, tokenizing. So um, we hear this a lot in the space, NFTs, tokens, and there seems to be a little bit of a uh, misconception on what exactly that is. People see a lot of pictures and marketplaces and people just selling a lot of things. But what exactly is an NFT? Well, an NFT is just a unit of account on the blockchain. If we were to look at a Web2 version of an NFT, it would just be a unit in a database. Um, the only difference is an NFT has a few um, interesting characteristics that make it unique on blockchain. Um, the first characteristic is it can be custodied. And this token, this unit of account can be custodied by a user, by another smart contract, whatever. Um, also with this uh, token, um, it can be automated within a smart contract. So uh, not only can it have certain attributes outlined in a smart contract, I sort of have a uh, commodity token here where it has some attributes like the name, the type, 
you can have attributes like that, but I can also have it automated in code. I have an expiration date um, in this little example. And a good example could be, let's say there was a commodity token. And let's say this commodity token can't be sold past the expiration date. There's a little bit of the code that says X can't happen or X can happen um, based off these parameters. Well, now you can take that token that can be custodied and you can allow for a series of automation tools on top of it to allow it to, uh, to allow additional functionality. Um, and then you have the metadata that's associated with the token. And this is where people get really a lot of things confused. Uh, the metadata of the token is what describes the token, maybe a picture associated with the token, uh, and any data about the token. And this metadata primarily is data that'd be used to be referenced on a screen, whether it's in a web app or a mobile application. So if you had a commodity token, sort of like how I have here, and you had some metadata about it, and it was and it was grain. Well, when you're picturing that commodity token on a let's say a commodity trading app, you would see the picture of the token be a picture of some grain as well as some information about the token. That would be uh, a bit of the metadata. And the token itself can be automated in the smart contract as code, but the metadata can allow you to reference that token uh, within an interface. Uh, like I said, this is where people normally reference the pictures, but that doesn't mean that's the only thing. It's just some metadata to reference on a screen somewhere for people to see what the token is and then reference it in the account um, to show who may custody that, uh, that token. But as a unit of account, an NFT can represent anything. It can represent assets, invoices, points. Uh, if you had a game, it could represent the, represent the items in a game. If sort of when I say points, like if you were to create a DAP that was to keep track of all of the different points in a different uh, sports league. Uh, each point that's generated could be a token in itself, just as a unit of account to reference as one, two, three, X amount of points, whatever it may be. And essentially that's the biggest thing with uh, tokens. They're more of a type of thing than they are a thing. Um, they could be a representation of anything, um, but that just depends on what you want to represent. Um, the biggest thing in trade finance, we like to represent assets and we can even automate those assets with the code and um, we can allow for additional uh, functionalities uh, on top of that. This is where people can build sophisticated type of derivatives, options, contract. These different tools can be referenced as tokens themselves, but then the service that regulates the contract, like an options contract could be within the uh, smart contract, the, the, the tool that's used to regulate the token. And, um, and this could be for anything. So you could have a smart contract regulate the tokens of a board game and based off what uh, based on what spot you are in different rules may apply tokens can be referenced as uh, a unit of account so maybe i'm just keeping track of my inventory and i wanted to create some additional automation tools on my inventory let's say if i'm below 50 percent, i want a notification um that could be another thing that, that can be used it's just a unit of account with a set of automation tools on it that can be custodied with a bit of metadata that can be referenced in the ui and i think if i could touch back on my original point to highlight what you just said here because it is an, an inventory or essentially a, a unit of account that is helping us identify essentially what these new electronic trading bills are essentially trying to get us to move towards, which is the, recogni the recognition of essentially what is possessable, right? Because I think when we look at trade finance globally, we and I address this because we are here to solve a lot of the issues that are kind of holding back the markets from moving forward by trying to clarify these things, because a lot of it is what could be considered noise, in the sense of news and a lot of it is how do we coordinate it back to application of that knowledge so that these businesses can take major leaps forward through their understanding so that we can approach what would be considered society 6.0 and in this case society 6.0 really highlights the ability of what it means for iot devices to be able to create digital documents that can illustrate the rights to possess that data or the benefits of that data and it always comes back to trade finance because when we are looking at a lot of what it means what is essentially these digital electronic documents um in law it's really important for everybody to understand that's really what they're trying to identify is what is the base not the derivative of the nft or the asset and essentially that's why we're trying to be able to learn what is an nft because the nft will have those commodity 
metadata parameters that are important to be able to continue to be called upon by various applications. Because if this contract that Quincy has created here for this commodity, it, it's created by him because he's tokenized something and then he's able to go ahead and put it into the markets, it would be ideal that a completely different person across the world has an application that can essentially identify all of these different parameters and then that way share it with their public because essentially that's using and maximizing the smart contract for what it is, which is transparency. And so I love this slide here and I really just wanted to highlight that because it does create this understanding between the hybrid model that's being created through the opportunity of the latest regulation. So I really do think if everybody got a good look at that smart contract that Quincy has laid out there, it'll really give you a good idea of how supply chain and different applications can start really having what Quincy mentioned as daplets or dap to dap communication through these smart contracts. Yeah, actually, I think uh, what you stated there is also a really good point to what I mean uh, in terms of uh, global shared accounting and shared accounting. Um, you could have this uh, commodities token uh, reside inside of a futures contract. And upon completion of the futures contract or exercising of the futures contract, that same token, uh, that same commodity be moved into a supply chain contract for delivery. Uh, these could have two entirely separate applications, one finance application, one supply chain application made by two entirely separate teams, but they're able to seamlessly be able to move that unit of account between the two applications to create a more uh, frictionless system. Uh, and this essentially goes on, exp this goes on exponentially the more, the more applications you involve and the more tokens that you can involve between those applications. Um, as opposed to uh, in a traditional setting, different applications having different segregated environments and then trying to get those environments to update each other uh, and trying to get, get them to sync. And when you have exponential amount of uh, participants engaging with each other, this becomes incredibly difficult because they're all able to engage with each other simply by interacting with smart contracts contracts on chain, passing tokens between these smart contracts. Uh, you could have hundreds, if not thousands of different uh, third party applications that have nothing to do with each other, able to seamlessly be able to pass uh, value between each other, uh, whether that be in the form of tokens, whether that be in the form of capital with the native, uh, to uh, with the native asset, whether that be in the form of services and being able to execute third party services, they have an easy and simple means of being able to, uh, to be able to have access to that. All right, we can get to the next one. So I put derivatives and neutral value exchange. Uh, the biggest thing for this is sort of what I was talking about with uh, tokens being able to reside in each other and um, allowing for additional functionality. Here I have a forward and futures contract uh, where you have a set of commodities within each one, but also the contracts themselves are tokenized where you have the creator of the token, uh, creative, creator of the token, uh, the seller who's able to have certain controls and able to manage uh, certain settings on the futures contract. And then you may have the buyer who's able to buy the token to redeem the value within the contract. And essentially you can have these tokens that can be nested within different services and continuously, continuously be nested within other services to allow for additional functionality. Due to each different smart contract being able to custody assets of another smart contract, um, you have a means of being able to nest services within each other. Now, this could be financial services like moving different uh, assets through uh, derivative contracts. These could be uh, different services like allowing um, different smart contracts access and keys or licensing keys uh, to give them access to services they wouldn't otherwise have access to. Um, or this could just be a whole jumble of different applications that are just delegating services to each other by referencing a token to do so. But uh, the main point is you can take tokens and you can nest them within other smart contracts to allow them additional services uh, and allow them additional access to uh, functionalities. And I sort of just uh, uh, displayed that here with like an actual derivative, a futures contract, but um, you can do that with literally anything. And I think you used a really good analogy earlier that I think highlights what you're saying here. It's the relationship between essentially the financial decentralized applications, the supply chain decentralized applications, and the relationship with the retail decentralized applications where essentially the retail applications are capturing obviously the 
attention of the, the the buyers, but essentially how the financial applications are creating assets that are basically being handed across different players or across the supply chain. And this is kind of where it goes back to being able to understand that the NFT becomes essentially an identifier or a unit of account in a certain you know, accounting book, globally shared accounting book that allows us to be able to reference back to it. Even if, uh, you know, anybody can call back to that, obviously, depending on the public and private chain. And I think that that's really what gives us the versatility to create smart markets is that we can really use these different points of data to be able to refer back at and, and I go back to the Oracle only because it's the most important thing here for the synergies between all of these apps. Uh, if I'm understanding correctly, and hopefully for the public to understand, it would be that the prices may change because obviously an asset uh, created by a financial application maybe is created. Uh, I'm sorry, an asset might have been created by financial applications under a certain in a certain protocol or a certain way to leverage that asset. But essentially, it is the capital that's being put into the markets that matters. And, and at this point, it becomes a matter of how can we go ahead and start moving these markets towards markets that can allow for commodities and other derivatives to essentially be unlocked liquidity in the future through other ways to leverage these commodities if they're being created in a regulated fashion. Because I think and I go back to this because in the law, it goes back and it says that, you know, if an electronic document is controllable then in law, it can be possessed because it's met those requirements for the law. Now, obviously, it's all about the controllability of contracts, and it comes down to the ability to fo uh, fall on certain regulated principles that I think that as we continue to expand these smart markets, if these concepts are not understood, what you're illustrating here with the derivatives and the neutral value exchange, then it's going to make it really hard to have a synchronized or obviously a smooth supply chain as we go forward because there will be discrepancies or kind of misaligned applications. And so do you have any advice for how it is that certain things can at least be really touched upon so that there can at least be some kind of ideas upon which we can start to kind of really look back on, whether it's at the point of tokenization Right. Or the point of identity. What do you think is the best because you, you know, we were touching on a, on a subject and I want to go back to it. If you can kind of maybe touch on it for the, everybody that might be listening. It's that concept of identity. Right. Because essentially any commodity is going to have to be able to reference an, an owner. And that owner is essentially going to have to be this uh, address wallet that has a specific identity. And so can we go back to that? How do we connect identities and assets um, i think this goes into like the, the the element of like the nested token idea what i was saying before so let's say you had a token that represented an id right and now that you have now that you have access to this token that represents an id you now have access to these tools that require an id to access them you see what i mean so let's say you had a series of fintech tools and you simply can't access the functionality unless you hold an identity token well, once you have a, hold an identity token, you now have access to these different services. Now, in those services, you may have access to third-party smart contracts that also have other services. Let's say you buy a oil futures. Well, that oil futures may be a token within a uh, financial application, and then the actual oil contract or the actual oil uh, asset may be within that oil futures. And then essentially, you're able to uh, you're able to leverage the possession of this now oil futures simply because you have access to this application via your identity token via your the service that you possess and the token you possess and within that service and then the tokens that are possessed within uh those applications and those services as well you see what i mean so with a and it, it kind of really starts with identity as well because you can't have uh, trade finance or fintech without being able to identify your trade partners but the thing is is being able to have additional um accessibility um with identity is a good example a hundred percent and i'm really grateful that we were able to touch on this because it is essentially the bedrock of everything that's going on and it's just unless that's understood that it is a key part of what we would consider the concepts because these are concepts that at circularity finance are being implemented as the key bedrock of what it means to be able to create 
an identity that can you can attach commodities to ownership to asset security it doesn't matter but essentially you're trying to be able to create the foundation for what allows trade finance to continue through identification of assets and the public if if you guys can take away the message of identity is important if you want to continue to stack on these other principles of what the technology can do and that's why i think it's so important that we look at this neutral value exchange because it's not limited to financial assets so Thank you, Quincy. I really appreciate you breaking that concept down. Yeah, we can go to the next uh, the next slide. Ah, uh, yes, Daplets, my favorite my favorite uh, uh, segment or topic. So with Daplets, so um, I sort of I was going to sort of put it. So Daps can connect to each other and uh, and leverage the functionalities off of each other. But when it comes to smart contract applications, there's sort of two applications. You have full-blown production applications and daplets. Now, what's a daplet? A daplet is essentially some function or service that doesn't that doesn't justify needing its own uh, full-blown application. This includes the interface. This includes all the different components that allow for a user to interact with an application. This is just a stagnant smart contract that other smart contracts can execute off of. Um, now, why is this important? Um, actually, the majority of applications that operate on blockchain operate in this way, where there are these they're sort of like these disconnected microservices that can be executed by other disconnected microservices or users directly. Traditionally, when you build an application, you build the application for users directly to interact with it. But with dApps and Daplets um, and how easy it is to be able to launch different services on chain um, and the ease of access for different applications to execute off of these, um, you essentially may end up getting a new type of app. And a perfect example of this new type of app are oracles. When people look at oracles on chain, it's not like the average user interacts with an oracle directly. A oracle is being referenced by another smart contract that needs a price feed or needs some sort of external uh, API data. And then that smart contract uses that oracle to be able to operate however it needs to. Um, an oracle is a perfect idea of a daplet because users don't interact with oracles directly. They interact with daps that interact with oracles. And that's the thing, uh, third-party daps can interact with those daps that are interacting with those oracles and so on and so on. Um, so uh, with smart contract uh, functionality, whenever you build a dap, you don't necessarily, these daps aren't necessarily the same. Now, not doesn't mean they don't have to be, but these dApps can essentially be isolated services that can be referenced by other services or referenced by other users. Um, and because every single dApp um, has the means for every other dApp and every other user to execute off of it, um, you sort of end up with this very niche web of services being able to be uh, certain, currently called right now. Right now, a perfect example of this would be um, the current NFT marketplaces, the current DEXs, for every NFT marketplace and for any every NFT in that marketplace, um, the, the marketplace is its own smart contract and every token in the marketplace is its own smart contract. And then the marketplace is referencing all those other tokens and all those other contracts to make up its marketplace, um, as well as DEXs. Whenever you see DEXs reference all these tokens, they're all referencing other third-party smart contracts to do so. Um, and this will work so on and so forth when uh, you start seeing different uh, trade derivatives come into play and we start seeing GameFi come into play. And you start seeing other different type of uh, blockchain services come into play. Anybody can tap into these services directly. So you're probably going to end up seeing a lot more just isolated services that are executing um, different functionality, like, for instance, a futures contract or a derivative contract. Um, it doesn't necessarily need a full app to do its function. Um, other third-party applications can reference its function within their full application. So an example of this could be, you could have a Robinhood-like application that operates on the blockchain, but you could have third-party services creating third-party financial instruments that can be referenced by that Robinhood-like application. That Robinhood-like application may have nothing to do with those financial services being generated, but since they operate on the blockchain and since anyone could reference them directly, third-party apps can, and it's sort of like how applications reference third-party APIs now, except every single dApp can be referenced sort of like its API can be referenced as opposed to uh, developers needing to set up an API and set up uh, a means for these means for users to interact with it. Um, but the main premise is 
Uh, just like dApps can have a full-blown production application with a user interface and a user experience, um, a good portion of applications are going to operate as individualized services for other applications to reference off of, sort of like oracles, for example, um, or any other sort of service that that the primary the primary value of the service is additional services uh, referencing it as opposed to a full production user application. Now, creating new business models. One of the biggest things with blockchain technology is how cheap it is to operate applications. Due to applications operating on decentralized networks, instead of having to pay for hosting costs, you pay for transaction costs. So uh, the means of being able to run the backend logic for an application no longer has a cost that is an ongoing hosting cost. It's just for every execution you may make out of the, out of the application, uh, there's a transaction cost, which is primarily, ex it's primarily uh, paid by the person who makes the execution. Um, one of the biggest things with that is since it's so cheap to operate an application and being able to use payments with the native token in the form of microtransaction sales um, and even potentially payouts from those microtransactions and sales, you could have these applications that have very, very low uh, uh, minimal to no uh, operation costs that are able to generate revenue by microtransactions and sales off of the use case of that application. Uh, these can be microtransactions like uh, charging pennies to charging a couple cents per execution for access to a service. Uh, these can be sales like selling license tokens to access to different functionalities of a different smart contract. This could be um, selling specific items within a smart contract. Um, whatever it may be, the operation of these services are incredibly cheap simply because of the decentralized nature of the application. Um, so with that being with that being the case, uh, you can have a no a whole new economy of applications that are able to generate revenue with very little to no uh, operation costs because they operate on decentralized networks. Um, can you get to the next one? I was going to elaborate a little bit more. So one example that I usually give is uh, automated shares. And what this means is, and this is sort of like a full encompassing idea of what a blockchain uh, company might look like. Uh, due to the operation cost of a smart contract being incredibly low, uh, and due to smart contracts having a native means to integrate payments um, into their services, so I can build a dApp that can very easily accept micropayments or accept sales or whatever it may be. Um, I could also have that same application be able to issue payments or issue dividends to a set of shareholders, sort of like I would in a traditional company. And all of these different components would operate uh, without any sort of hosting costs involved. The operation and management of the application, the issuance of the dividends, issuance of the payments, the uh, executions of the payments when people interact with the application, all of these operations are operate autonomously. So you could have a, let's say for instance, an, an application that, uh, let's say it was an analysis software and it, it pulled analysis data from a DEX and it cost two cents to reference that data from another application. And as those applications uh, interact with this uh, service, this service is able to generate revenue. Well, the entire means of this application being able to operate uh, is incredibly cheap because it's running autonomously. And it's able to continuously generate revenue based off of the needs of other services. And these are unlike any other application before because uh, traditionally um, businesses would need to justify the business before they can essentially uh, like run the business. You know, the business needs to make money in order for the business to run where these applications really in theory just operate autonomously and they'll generate revenue as people need access to them. Um, and these apps uh, don't necessarily need a giant company to justify running them. They could be uh, dormant for months and somebody six months from now could utilize the application and utilize the service and the service is still available as opposed to a company needing to constantly uh, generate revenue just to keep the operation afloat. Um, and these applications can scale from one user, 10 users, 1,000 users, to as many users without the intervening or, or without the uh, original developers intervening in that process. Traditionally, as applications scaled up, um, a developer would need to scale up more servers and more databases to do so. Uh, presuming the users still have access to the services on blockchain, um, they will always have access to these services without any intervention on your part. 
Now, there is an element of if you're managing your own RPCs, you need to scale up your own RPCs. But if they're using a third-party application, that third-party application may be scaling its own RPCs to have access to your uh, DAP, which means you wouldn't necessarily have to intervene in order for people to access it. One thing I really want to touch on, and I hope everybody caught that, um, the big picture for me, you just described it. That was that moment, and I think you just hit on it, and that's why I love listening to you. I break it down every time because it is those – it is that concept that should help people kind of understand the true value of blockchain. It is the programmed profit distribution that could be generated out of these micro profits per transaction that are occurring on these applications, as you mentioned, for any of those calls. And I say that because we often have, you know, companies trying to really keep track of accounting and breaking their head over it. But at the end of the day, when you have these applications and you have these wallets and you separate these the right way, you're able to really keep accounting a lot more simplified. And more importantly, you can program where you want that profit to go. And I say that because that's one of the key foundations of smart markets, that they must be able to have in some type of integration into GDP kind of productivity, right? Obviously, we want to improve each nation's productivity as DLT or blockchain-based businesses are being created. They're able to define the way that they can participate in these type of relationships even further to really bring value to their specific nation or wherever they're operating from. And specifically, the programmed profit distribution, I think, is what you're touching on by being able to say that NFTs in this case, can help you be identified on the blockchain as a recipient or as a deserved beneficiary of what that application produces. And to me, that was the moment that I think if everybody can kind of understand what is happening, if you want to elaborate that a little bit more, I know that you have a few more slides. Actually, but this I, is I'll the last back. slide, but I do want to elaborate. Um, uh, one of the things uh, there's too, so yeah, so I built this contract about a year ago. I think it's the XRC shares contract. It's like, uh, it, it's to uh, issue dividends off of incoming revenue for an application. But there can be, and each token that's associated with these shares are an NFT. But there can be even light layers to this too. So you can have one token that can be a reference for the, uh, that can be a reference point for, um, for outgoing payouts or outgoing dividends. You can have another token that's for operation of the application. I think an example, I wrote an article about this. Uh, I think the example I gave was, uh, let's say you had a lemonade shop, right? And this lemonade, uh, let's say this lemonade shop had a set of investors that invested $100 for 20% of the shares of this lemonade shop. Um, you may have a set of shares be NFTs that represent um, that portion of the lemonade shop. But you also may have sort of an administrator NFT that can open and close the lemonade shop, that can open and close, that can show a sale, that can. So you may have one set of tokens that may show the uh, automated issuance of some sort of uh, of some sort of uh, dividend. One token that's just access to the application and administrative access to that application, like uh, in this example, is opening and closing the uh, lemonade shop. Uh, reloading the, the amount of supplies in the lemonade shop, you know, more lemonade, more tokens or whatever it may, may be. Um, and then you can even also have layers on top of that where you can have uh, uh, app, uh, certain specific services um, accessible by specific uh, tokens. So let's say there's only one person who's allowed to refill the lemonade, right? And let's say there's a specific uh, access token they may have for that. You may have an administrator token that can op open and close the lemonade shop. You may have a special token that allows for this person to fill up the lemonade, you know, in this example. And then you may have the share tokens that are able to, uh, that are able to reference as, uh, as shares in that lemonade stand. Um, all of these are tokens within the Lemonade Stand application, um, and all of these tokens give you some level of access within the Lemonade Stand, um, and they're all references NFTs, uh, but they're all tools and they're all units of account to allow you to have access and allow you to do different things within this app. Um, and this could go for any type of application. You could have a social media application that, that may have dividend payouts, but also an administrator uh, key uh, NFT that allows for you know, you know administrator processes like uh, resetting you know resetting somebody's account or whatever it may be. Um, the, these could be other tools and other tokens that are layered on top of the application that can allow you additional functionality for whatever your service may be. Um, 
that that's really yeah, this is my this is my last slide. So yeah, and I, I think that that's really one of the, the main reasons why I wanted to touch on that. Uh, and we do have some questions. Yes, amazing. Yeah. Would you go through the questions? Who throws some of the questions, Rick? Would you like me to do that? Yeah, you can, you can do it. Yeah, there is two questions from Hassan Khan. When call external API, is there any barrier we need to add? Or we can call it and it will be secure as blockchain is. And then cross-chain value exchange will be also suitable for private blockchain. What was that? So the, the first question is an API as secure as a blockchain? Uh, as a ledger is the api secure or was that the question yeah, i think what? what they're asking is if i deploy a smart contract and somebody were to call that from an external um api on their app let's say what they call the mm -hmm. smart contract would that call be safe yes yes so so the calls that are being made and a good way to look at it is the same call that's being made to your to your smart contract is just secure is just as secure as any other signature you'd make to the network. And then I'm sorry, what was the second one? I know that you mentioned there was another one, but I didn't catch it as well. Uh, cross uh, cross chain value exchange uh, is that also valuable on a private blockchain? So. Um, Typically, no, because with public blockchains, you're primarily focusing on moving value. With private blockchains, you're, you're specifically focused on moving data. Um, you may have people have specific access to uh, data on your private chain, and that can be and that can sort of be uh, designated um, on your like based on how you feel. So you can set up you can set up that as you like, but um, you wouldn't necessarily use a private. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily give. Um, access to a private chain unless you had some special relationship with that person you're giving access to. All right, thank you. Um, let's go uh, with... Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Well, can XDC DAP integrate with XRP hooks and work simultaneously? So it depends on the bridge. There are multiple bridges that do a lot of different things that try to accomplish these goals. Um, I think Flare is one bridge that's trying to accomplish these goals. Pretty sure WanChain is also trying to accomplish these goals. And I think the Impel bridge is trying to accomplish some goals similar to this. So it depends on the bridge that, it depends on the bridge, bridge's ability to pull that off that allows for that. Most bridges deal with moving, uh, moving some derivative asset across. So they'll wrap an asset and move it across. Um, and then other bridges uh, can also allow for the execution across chain uh, between dabs. Um, one more question, closing session. Yeah, and that's really where I think we're leading towards, you know, the ability to, and it's called the secure asset transfer protocol. So in case you guys are wondering what allows us to be able to move forward with confidence, it, it is those initiatives that allow us to be able to take the steps to be able to say, look, there's certain protocols that you have to take but it comes down to being able to create, as Quincy said, applications that can read each other's metadata so that that way they can understand the commodity parameters or the traits or the property rights of this asset that was just created on chain so that that way we can still refer back to the same one, give it the same beneficiary rights. And, and it really does come down to being able to understand what is the true value of each blockchain because you don't necessarily have to be on XDC, if you're specifically looking to do something completely different outside of trade finance or what you can consider to be scalability, because the true value, if I could share a lot more of the big picture that we've described or we're trying to help you guys understand is where are we moving towards? And that's why in our next conversation, we're going to be addressing a little bit more of how oracles can be used and the, the reason that we want to use these different types of new business models, it's so that we as the people interested in the technology who are currently running businesses involved in these corporate entities, we can take the next step to be able to go ahead and start to create applications that create profit. And that profit can be put into specific liquidity pools to facilitate trade finance for SMEs. And 
if we can start seeing how the automation process of this can happen, you'll see that the flow of money occurs by the adoption of the technology because as more companies are using this new business model that Quincy was describing, we will be able to start doing the distribution of profits towards specific pools that will allow us to be able to put capital to work and then allowing these trade finance to occur because of these liquidity pools, which provide alternative financing options for those players who are looking to get involved and open these new commodities and these new rights of possessing these digital assets. And that's the true advantage of these smart markets. And that's why in our next engagement, when we learn a little bit more about oracles and how they can be used to create new business models, I think everybody's really going to be able to start seeing the big picture even more clearly. Are you able to listen? Is there any more questions that might be coming through there? Uh, are, you, are, are you able yeah. to listen to me? Yes, Perfect. I can. So I'll wrap up the session because we come on top of the hours. Now we'll love to give appointment to the audience to next October the 19th, where we're going to touch the topics of oracles with the team of PLI plugin, our good mates from Abu Dhabi. So I thank both of you. I thank you, and Quincy, for being with us today. It was a very insightful, very informative session that I really, really enjoy. And I beg everybody who were with us today to consider it as a very The whole new world, you see. Of thank you, Andrea. So, with that said, appreciate you. Uh, appreciate everybody coming uh, to the today's session. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we did record. We will send a follow up email with the recording link, uh, and we can also share a copy of the presentation. So, thank you to our special guests. Yep. Very, very informative. Thank you. Um, and thanks, everybody, uh, for being with us. Hope to see you thank on the you. next one. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Quincy. Thank Thanks, Johnny. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Andrea.